Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Oh, seatbelt. And no, we won't do the, we don't have the do 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 we? And phone. Is it more intelligent than I am? Car thinks it's more intelligent. It's probably right, actually. There we go. So what is it? What is it? It's another lovely day in paradise. Oh, Wednesday the 24th of May. It's gorgeous outside. It's literally hot already. And it's only 8.30. I'll shut the window because I've got the windows open. So it might. There we are. Not that the, uh, <clears throat> the cooling doesn't work in this car. It's a, it's a heap of old crap, basically. But it gets me from A to B, which is fine by me. So what should we talk about today? Well, I mean, you already know, don't you? I don't, I'm not even sure. But by the time I've thought about what to talk about and uh, put the titles on, and then you've already watched the titles, so you know more than I do at this stage. So bearing in mind that you know what we're talking about and I don't, why don't you suggest it? Yeah? All right then. <laughs> okay. Oh dear. <clears throat> I had um, another grandchild arrive last night. Baby X, boy, eight pound three ounces. So, mother and baby doing well as they all say. So my wife and my other daughter are gonna bomb over to have a look at that. What's Muggins got? Muggins has got the work, hasn't he? Muggins has got to give someone his bleaching trays. Oh yeah, that's far more important, isn't it? Than just celebrating the birth of a grandson. Ah. Anyway, no, I suppose I could take the day off work. A little tip for you. If you're going to take the day off work, do it at short notice, okay? If you, um, if you, let's say you cancel a day, I mean, it's best not to cancel. And I'm not booked up three months ahead anyway. But supposing I wanted to take a day off to go and see a Britney Spears concert I, in three months' time, then, you know, you obviously you book it off. And then you, what happens is you find it's the one day you've got a patient booked in. So what you do is you ring up the patient and say, I'm sorry, I've had to reorganise the book. Can we get you to come in on another day? And that's not too much of a problem because most people who are booking three months in advance can, they're not so booked up that that's the only day they can come in, you know? So they... They don't, they don't like it, you know, it's inconvenient and it's doing something for you without them getting anything back, but they'll do it then. And then you've got the sh real short notice cancellations, like the so-and-so's not coming in today, he's got a migraine. Now remember that, because I'll come back to that later. So patients like, they do understand that things happen at short notice. <clears throat> and uh, that uh, you may not be able to come into work because something has happened to you that morning and it means that the surgery's had to take a back seat and uh, you've got to deal with this other issue, you know? I mean, obviously it depends on what it is. I mean, if you say it's like, uh, you know, uh, the Met Office has forecast a nice sunny day and Mr. Watson won't be coming in, then <laughs> they're gonna get a bit pissed off, aren't they? But if the, the best excuse, right, is a migraine because it's completely unpredictable. It's completely not your fault. Then nobody holds anybody to blame for getting a migraine. And to a certain extent, there's a, there's a measure of public sympathy involved because it's a very, very painful condition. And so they're not gonna say, well, you know, I'm good. <laughs> I think I'm happy to hear he's got a migraine for canceling my appointment. They're like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, you know? So they can't, so you can cancel at short notice. So the one thing patients hate is, uh, is when you ring them up and say, uh, you know, about seven to 10 days in the future, and you say, I'm sorry, um, you know, Mr. Watson's decided uh, he's, he needs to do something next Wednesday afternoon. Um, so he's, I've been told to cancel all these patients. Patients effing hate that. That is basically what you're saying to the patient is, I'm more important than you are. I mean, We've made this agreement to meet at a certain time and a certain date, but as far as I'm concerned, that's not very important to me and something else has come up that I'd rather do instead. And so, uh, you know, I've decided to have a game of golf on Wednesday afternoon because it's the only time my, you know, my golf mate is available. So I'm gonna cancel my patients. So sorry, just reorganize. 
and the and the problem with the seven to seven, seven to ten day cancellation is it's almost like always it's not like the three month cancellation where they can say well you're in on the 24th shall we put you in on the 25th they're, they're like no you know no, I, I can't if I cancel you on next Wednesday I can't get you in for, for another three weeks unfortunately because Mr Watson's box is led <laughs> so my advice to you is this if you decide that you want to have a game of golf I'm not whether it's a spontaneous game of golf or a planned game of golf that you want to plan seven to ten days in advance, do not cancel the patience. Now, this is going to sound harsh and this is going to sound inconsiderate and to a certain extent it is, but the best thing to do is to wait until the Wednesday lunchtime and then say to your nurse or receptionist, cancel the patience this afternoon, I've got a migraine, I'm going home. And what they'll do is they'll ring up and they'll say to all these patients, I'm never so sorry, Mr. Watson's had to go home, he's got a migraine. And they'll go, oh, ever so sorry. Well, I can rebook you in two or three weeks, don't worry, everything will be fine. We'll stick a prescription for some antibiotics in the post. And the patients, for the most part, they'll be, and you won't hear anything about that. In fact, the only thing you'll hear is when the patients come back, they'll say, oh, I was so sorry to hear about you know your migraine the other day. Do you get migraines? I get migraines sometimes. They're terrible, aren't they? You know, what a, what a curse. The curse to bear and you having to take time off you know, work at short notice and everything must be so inconvenient for you. And you're like, and that's that's the worst bit because like you're really guilty. <laughs> you're like, oh, no, I've never had a migraine in my life. Well, that's not true. I have had a migraine. And I don't tend, I honestly, I don't cancel my patients much. I'm just talking to you. I'm to, you're the one that cancels. You're the one that wants to take time off a short notice. Not me, I don't. Look at me. I'm going to work and my, should be going to see my grandson. Don't accuse me of skiving off. So anyway, if that's what you want to do, that's how you do it. Not months in advance not weeks in advance, but on the day. Right, we're coming up to Death Junction. Don't know what happened to the video yesterday. I'm sure that was Russian hackers. There's been the predictable, the predictable knee-jerk reaction to this terrorist bomb, which basically consists of every bit of old faulty low forehead fascistic thinking about how to control and manipulate the population has now been dusted off. You Can you just imagine it? Apart from uh, Theresa May, the, the agenda, which was all about her social uh, proposals, you know, to um, dip into the, <laughs> the equity of everybody who, after death, by <laughs> the ghost of Christmas to come, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, this massive miscalculation on the way up, on the run up to the election of, of fleecing the middle class, which the Tories really were the, the party that was sort of could be relied upon not to fleece the middle class. Uh, so they made this mistake of giving it, giving out this information in advance of the election instead of shortly afterwards, which is how they normally do it. Um, and what a godsend. What a godsend. Now, is anyone talking about social care policy now? No. They're all talking about a camera in every toilet, aren't they? CCTV in your bathroom. And don't forget, uh, Theresa May was, um, uh, she was quite right wing as a home secretary. Uh, I've got a, indirectly, I've got some personal experience of that because I mean, we all know, I mean, we've all got patients, haven't we? And relatives who work in various, jobs and professions and you get the inside track that's the good thing about being a dentist is you do get a lot of the inside track on various bits and bobs and uh, you know the police federation hated Theresa May they hated her mind you they don't really have a much of a track record of liking any home secretary I can't remember the last time home secretary probably actually it's Douglas Hume or someone that they actually liked probably Robert Peel but uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, my chest got stuck. That and my legs have got shorter. 
So, uh, yeah, so obviously they boo the Home Secretary, don't they? Did not like Doug Theresa May. And, uh, mind you, you see, I mean, there used to be like a convention at the annual general meeting and uh, that uh, the sort of the relevant minister would come along or the Secretary of State and they would be treated with, with a reasonable degree of respect. And uh, that, that all, that's all out the window now. I mean, that in dentistry, that happened with Edwina Curry when she went along to talk to, um, I, forget, I forget who it was, it may have been the BDA conference or the LDC conference or something, and she got booed. And I mean, she should have got booed because she was an idiot. Uh, but the point was that this sort of veneer of respectability broke down. This, uh, this deference, you know, this deference to our, our, our betters, our elders and betters, the people who know better than us. And it was quite obvious that she didn't know any better than us. It's quite obvious still that nobody in the Department of Health or government knows better than us in terms of dentistry. And yet there's still this deference, oh yeah, no, you're elected. You're elected. I mean, they are elected, they're democratic. They have democratic authority, that is true. They have the democratic authority to make decisions, but not. they don't, they're not imbued with, they're not bestowed with <laughs> immense knowledge just because they're elected. They, yeah, they get to make the decisions, but they don't get to make the right decisions. They don't, just being elected doesn't mean you make the right decisions. It just means you make them. You know, the decisions that you make are, are good or bad. And that's, history judges you on whether or not, as an elected official, your decisions were good or bad. So saying, so the British Dental Association saying, for example, to the Department of Health or, or the Minister for Health or the Secretary of State for Health, you, you're elected. Therefore, you know, what do we do? What do we do? <laughs> they should say, look, this is what we do. You have this authority to sign this into law. It's a sensible decision. We can justify it. You know, this is evidence based. We can prove, we can show you how to be a success to go down in history as a successful politician. But what do they do? No, they say, oh no. No, you decide, you know? It's like a patient who comes in where he's got a choice between implants or a chrome denture. They're like, he's like, you say, well, these are your options. Well, you decide, what, what shall I do? I don't know. What are your priorities? I don't know. You know, you get these patients who can't decide. And now, and so we've got, <laughs> You've got a BDA that's totally abdicated any sort of authority over how dentistry should be run to a Department of Health that's got absolutely no idea how dentistry should be run. <laughs> and the usual feedback mechanism, which is where you get an incompetent person in an elected position, is completely not working because all the people that are in charge of dentistry are not elected. They're all in the House of Lords. And uh, they're all senior civil servants. There's not, there's not an elected person you could sack. Anyway, talking of LDC conferences, I shall not be going to this year's LDC conference, which will be no loss, either for me or for them. <laughs> they're, uh, we sort of fell out. I, I did do a video on this after the LDC conference. I might link to it if I can, if I can work out how to link to things in videos. And uh, I uh, was trying to uh, increase the reach. I was trying to sort of uh, help turn the LDC conference into some sort of semi-reasonable debating chamber, some, something where the issues of the day could be discussed and possibly decided and, uh, and may have some impact, you know, and make a difference, rather than the uh, expense, expense spending odometer pressing jamboree, which it's, it's been for the past 20 years. And um, so I suggested, this was at a time when uh, Periscope and all these things, uh, live broadcasting apps that you could get from your mobile phone had been um, uh, just been invented. Like, literally it was like that within three or four months of having been announced, uh, Periscope and Meerkat I think is the other one or whatever. So, And you're given a carte blanche to broadcast um, and then, then when I told them what, you know, I 
mentioned to a couple of people what I was intended to do, they sort of squished that quite quickly because they don't, last thing they wanted was, it was, it was very um, reminiscent of the debate that was in the House of Commons over whether or not the uh, the uh, debate should be broadcast to the to the nation. And on the one hand, you had people saying that this is important uh, policy crucible and therefore should be the profession should be witness to this it should be open open source you know we should be uh, <clears throat> open and, and broadcast and open to the accessible but then on the other hand in the department in the in the house of commons you had these conservatives with a very small like a tiny c like so so small that they're like conservatives and basically they were saying um this is going to uh, interfere with the dignity of the chamber and it's going to influence the debate. The mere fact that the debate is broadcast will change the nature of the debate and uh, to the detriment of the chamber and that uh, people will start grandstanding and they will realise that they've got a television audience and therefore they will start, you know, bringing along graphs and charts and uh, talking for a lot longer than they would do normally because they're on the telly. <laughs> so... Fortunately, it's so bloody boring that nobody watches, so it's hardly worth grandstanding, apart from once a week at Prime Minister's Question Time. Then not even anybody really watches that, I don't I certainly don't, I wouldn't know. Unless I, I think it's on a Wednesday, or well, they might have changed it, I don't know. But then, but you've got all these same arguments at the LDC conference, you know, that, oh, it's not, it's not a good idea to broadcast it because, and their, but their arguments were completely different. I mean, first of all, there was like the un, the unseen argument, which was that everybody's half pissed from the night before. And so the main argument was that uh, we don't want anything broadcast because um, we might we might get embarrassed. <laughs> Somebody might say something which they later regret <laughs> and wish they hadn't said. Or they may uh, they may come <laughs> they may come up with an opinion that whilst known to their close friends and colleagues is not known to the people who send them there <laughs> and he's not might be quite the opposite of what they're telling their local party their local LDC that they are actually campaigning for something whereas in fact privately they might be campaigning against it and if this was all broadcast then all this will come to light A scandal <laughs> you know severe loss of uh, expense accounts and <laughs> and uh, and, uh, dick and chicken dinners so, so anyway, they, um, I mean, they gave me, uh, they gave me more than my allotted three minutes to, uh, to argue for this. And I think it's possible they have shifted, uh, forwards, but you know, the format, the format for the LDC conference has been the same since time immemorial since it, you know, which is basically the, uh, they have a load of, um, crazy, crazy motions like, uh, request to improve oral health <laughs> in the National Health Service and pay people properly and which they you know no no they don't you know what they are sort of there's this conflict between what the grassroots want and what the British Dental Association wants and is able to deliver and so they have to sort of cobble all these motions together and nobble them and uh, combine them and uh, reword them you know they have a conference agenda committee whose job is to sort of try and trash together some sort of agenda so then um, and then you have like a four hours of everybody letting off steam and then the, the British Dental Association explaining why none of what was resolved last year got done and then an appeal to give money to the BDA benevolent fund and it winds up an hour late uh, with only like a tenth of the delegates there because they all although they knew it was going to finish at five They've all got cheap trains booked at four and they've all left at half past three <laughs> Yeah, it's all that massive so if you pay the LDC levy Which I obviously don't and but you may do I don't know you may feel some some <laughs> patriotic urge to give money to these guys so that they can uh, get pissed then by all means carry on. If you think that uh, you're getting value for money, then please do email me and let me know how, because I'd love to know. 
but it's all in apparently it's all on this weekend I think I've got there's one paragraph in one dental magazine somewhere and, uh, it's not like the old days of uh, Arthur Eisenstadt and Helen Hay when you know the whole thing was really quite key to decision making and policy making and I think the good thing about the LDC conference in theory in theory not in practice because in practice it's been you know there's this thing called regulatory capture where uh, a body like the LDC is taken over by the BDA and they are good at doing that um, in theory it could be a good a good way to decide policy because it is independent you know it is a grassroots movement but uh, nobody uh, you know, the BDA is not going to let a grassroots movement stay independent. <laughs> Don't be stupid. Are you being stupid? Don't be stupid. <laughs> so anyway, good luck to them. Anyway, I hope they. Uh, I hope it's a really, really lovely weekend because they're going to be stuck indoors all day and uh, and stuck on trains. So uh, they're going to miss it all. Okay. <laughs> that was no, no, no. That was bad. But angry. That was just not kind was it no I'm sorry I do apologize <laughs> okay bye